So to me, like to be honest, unless I saw these levels like really f spike into the sky and sustain there for a long period of time, I don't know how much I'd really What's up guys, Derek, more plates188.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about this 1977 study on D-Ball. Two to six weeks afterwards, a significant overcompensation in mean plasma test levels was observed. So basically, they show that D-Ball ended up increasing natural test levels after recovering from the cycle. Wanna get my thoughts on it, and um, I will be reacting to it in real time. I have not yet read it. Maybe it's a study I've seen already, you never know. This 1977 study on D-ball shows the effect of low-dose, short-term D-ball use. It also studied DHEA, but poofed. <laughs> Too long didn't read on the study. 12 D-ball only cycle gangsters, JK, runners, <laughs> well-trained, four-week cycle, five milligrams and 10 milligrams in placebo given at different times during the eight-month study. Figure one is a graph that shows total T, FSH, and LH levels starting from day one and ending five weeks post-cycle for the 10 milligram part of the study. It shows how rapidly and acutely D-ball crashes free test. 73% on average in four weeks. The five milligram crashed it by 66% in the same amount of time. That's great and all, but who cares? What we care about is that by day 10 post-cycle, no PCT drugs, free T levels had been restored. And after two weeks, free T levels had increased above pre-cycle levels in all participants. The researchers referred to this as overcompensation. The mean average increase was 20%. Even five weeks post-cycle, there was no signs of reduction. Actually, it seemed to be increasing. This study raises a lot of questions. Questions I reckon Eastern Bloc sports scientists and Derek may hold the answers to. The secret behind the success of many drug-tested athletes from the era pre-Delt God. <laughs> Why did this happen? Was it the short cycle length? Was it the small dose? Was it D-Ball's insanely short half-life? Was it all of the above? Logic suggests that some part of the body, HBTA, freaks the shit out after realizing T levels are hitting ATG squat depth and does whatever it can to restore, oh, ass to grass. How the fuck did I miss that? And it does whatever it can to restore baseline levels and then by the time everything else is restarted, it takes a while to realize and boom, 20% increased natural T for four weeks. Study could have been a whole lot better. For one, they could have carried on measuring after five weeks to find out when it dips back down. There's a million things that could have helped the outcome. What does this mean for us now? How can we abuse this mechanism <laughs> for anabolism and performance? I have no clue, but sounds cool. The problem is always the 10 days it takes to get back to baseline. Keeping the gains during this period is the issue. I mean, there's also the liver damage and the perma bulk bloat lord water retention, but like that's ever stopped us before. Would using a CERM for PCT for 10 days mitigate this or would it stop the overcompensation effect? Way more likely it stops the effect. I mean, there's a reason we all PCT and don't see this happen in blood work. What about reverse dieting? 5,000 IU, vitamin D, mega dose ectosterone, five grams L-carnitine daily. Who knows? I may end up experimenting with this, but also I don't feel like looking like a pregnant cow for four weeks. You definitely won't on 10 milligrams, bro. Also, blood work is expensive, way more expensive than D-ball. I would try 15 milligrams daily, possibly 20. If you want more useless articles like this, don't worry, my wife left some more coming soon. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Effective short-term treatment with an anabolic steroid, methandienone, and DHEA on plasma. Hormones, red cell volume, and 2,3-diphosphoglycerate in athletes. Um, all right, so let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Effective one-month course of a treatment with a potent anabolic steroid, d 5 and 10 milligrams daily, and a very weak androgen hormone precursor, DHEA, and plasma on placebo on plasma, testosterone, LH, and FSH levels. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Highly significant decrease in mean test was observed after 5 and 10 milligrams. Treatment with 40 milligrams of DHEA decreased mean testosterone levels by 41%. Oh, DHEA-S they're treating. Okay. Um, Pre-test... Testosterone levels were retained about 10 days after the end of the treatment period with higher doses of both compounds, while two to six weeks afterwards, a significant overcompensation in mean plasma levels was observed. No significant changes in plasma gonadotropins were seen immediately after treatment with either of these steroids, but later a tendency towards decreased FSH and LH levels was observed in the subjects who received the higher doses of both compounds. No significant changes in red cell volume, blah, blah, blah. All right, so what I would wanna see is Fuck, dude, it's fucking sideways. God damn it, dude. All right, there we go. D-ball, five milligrams, number of subjects, test levels before and after in nanomoles per liter, uh, ba -ba -ba, basal, FSH, LH. So, you know, I'm gonna be honest, dude. I think what we're seeing is not necessarily a 
overcompensation of test necessarily, rather the result of crashed SHBG. So we see here plasma testosterone levels in animals per liter. This is the DHEAS group. Um, we have the D-ball group here. Um, these fucking graphs being sideways, pissing me off. Um, conclusion on the basis, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's go back to the actual graphical representation here of the D-ball group. So plasma test levels, plasma LH and FSH. So we can see here that the, okay, the test levels here go down and they crash into nothingness, but then they end up over baseline here transiently. Okay, so it looks like it had absolutely nothing to do with free test levels after all. The guy mentioned here how free test levels um, increase to above pre-cycle levels, but it's actually total. So I thought the explanation was gonna be an obvious drop in SHBG. So then when you recover natural test production, the lack of SHBG um, due to an oral androgen that's gonna crush it into the ground, is going to result in transiently higher free testosterone levels proportionally, but it looks like it's actual total test levels that are spiking above baseline. So we have individuals who are starting here, crashing their test levels with the D-ball, getting off the D-ball, and then recovering to above baseline within a couple of weeks and actually sustaining it for fucking weeks after. So what would be the cause of that given the fact that LH and FSH levels are pretty much or not any higher, um, depends dude. The one thing I would say is that this is a very small sample size obviously. Um, the dosages used aren't necessarily dosages that are going to be used for performance enhancing purposes. Like again, 10 milligrams of D-ball is like borderline a replacement dose for androgen replacement therapy. Um, and then you have this overcompensation of tests, but you're dealing with that week of, you know, hypogonadal you know, levels essentially, where you have to deal with, you know, potentially the deterioration of lean muscle, trying to protect, you know, your hard earned progress. Um, and it seems like this is not, you know, a strategy that's really worth pursuing. Like if you can get a super compensated, you know, like over exaggerated effect of testosterone recovery after a short exposure to a low dose anabolic steroid that is otherwise essentially basically androgen replacement like, is that really worth it? to go through a couple of weeks of, you know, borderline hypogonadism in order to achieve a level that's transiently higher, not that much higher, like transiently higher to a point that it's probably not gonna have a significant impact on um, sports performance anyways. I don't know, but it is certainly um, interesting, nonetheless, given the fact that gonadotropins are actually no higher. So something is definitely overcompensating, or at least again, I would really boil this down to what time of day were these individuals getting their blood drawn? What was their diet like during this time? What's their sleep hygiene like? Is it possible they just have improved life, lifestyle factors now and it's just you know a snapshot in time? Because at the end of the day, these individuals, it's a very small sample size, testosterone is affected so significantly. Even taking your blood test you know, a few hours later in the day, in the afternoon versus in the morning, can have a major impact on what things are at because it operates on a diurnal rhythm in a pulsatile manner, manner. This is not something that necessarily equates to this snapshot in time is exactly equivalent to this snapshot in time in terms of your body's output of uh, you know gonadotropins and subsequent to that actual um, light extel sim stimulation, intratesticular testosterone production. So to me, like to be honest, Unless I saw these levels like really fucking spike into the sky and sustain there for a long period of time, I don't know how much I'd really read into this given the fact that you're basically shutting yourself down in order to put yourself in a state of hypogonadal, you know, very, very muscle deteriorating circumstances for a little bit of period of time with a barely performance enhancing amount of drug and sustaining, you know, borderline hypogonadal territory for a couple of weeks to then recover up to this super compensated increase in total tests. Like it's definitely not worth the reading into in my opinion. Like if you're gonna be doing a deep only cycle gangster cycle to begin with, you know, it's certainly interesting, I guess, to look into and there are ways that you could otherwise try and, you know, lessen the damage during this kind of like in-between phase where you're recovering. But ideally you would be using things that expedite recovery rather than focusing on vectors of, you know, what kind of random supplements can I take to enhance, to try and like prevent muscle protein breakdown when I otherwise could just, you know, try and get back to a hormonal baseline as quickly as possible. Now, again, D-ball half-life very, very short and the methyl estradiol production is, um, 
you know, problematic, but again, it's going to clear quick enough to a fact that to a point that you can get back to baseline within um, relatively short order. Like this is not, you know, a enanthate ester or some esterified um, injectable that you have to deal with, you know, a clearance time of like months or, you know, one month to two months or whatever the fuck it is, depending on the compound, you're dealing with like, you know, a week downtime until you get back to baseline. So it's not, um, you know, that, I don't know, like really into it, I think is like overanalyzing, trying to figure out how to leverage this kind of compensatory mechanism, whereby I think the compensatory mechanism may not even exist to begin with. It may just otherwise be individuals who came off of shit and want to make sure they recover and, you know, change their lifestyle accordingly or get, you know, a better sleep or they get, you know, their diet's more on point. They're getting more, you know, nutrients in, like whatever it is. I don't have, you know, a good enough assessment of this with a big enough sample size with controlled enough variables to be able to say for certain that this compensatory thing is actually going to happen if you pursue the Debo only cycle gangster cycle. So I wouldn't be confident assuming this is going to happen. And I definitely wouldn't pursue this cycle banking on it happening. However, during this time, there's definitely things you can do to try and, you know, prevent the, uh, you know, shitty period of time here where you could be prone to shit going wrong. And, you know, he's not off with things like, you know, using vitamin D, using carnitine. If you want to add an ER beta agonist, sure. Reverse dieting, making sure you're getting enough food in during this time. Absolutely reasonable. I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't think this is a useless article. I think it's worth, you know, digging into. I thought this was going to be a really obvious um, you know, free test being increased propor proportionally from lack of binding proteins. But interesting, there's actually, you know, a compensatory thing going on that that's what they've determined in the article. Uh, let's see, after one month, a mean increase of about 20% over the control level was apparent. The highest of the individual overcompensation values were significantly greater than the basal testosterone levels. Um, and they determine that in this study, the fall in test was about similar to the changes in earlier reports where higher doses of D-ball and longer time of therapy have been used. 100 milligrams per day for six weeks. Now that's a fucking cycle, bro. And 15 milligrams for two months. Long-term treatment with D-ball in large doses up to 100 milligrams per day has been reported to result in a marked depression of plasma test to almost castrate levels. The suppression of plasma test can be accomplished by inhibition of the hypothalamic hypo physial gonadal axis funny calling it this hypothalamic hypophysial gonadal axis by inhibiting testosterone biosynthesis in the gonads and by reducing the level of plasma test binding globulin as suggested recently the major causative mechanism active during androgen administration is probably the first in the study by Holma and Adler Krutz both the levels of LH and FSH fell to about 50% of their normal levels, which is in agreement with observations of the suppression of gonadotropins in some other papers caused by short-term testosterone infusion or by long-term use of D-ball. In agreement with the results of the present study, no alterations in gonadotropins were previously reported after nandrolone and decanoate or um, is this proviron treatment. These seemingly contradictory results may arise due to different affinity of anabolic compounds for hypothalamic receptors and or to differences in dosage and duration of therapy. Yeah, so obviously, you know, if there's a ester attached to it with decanoate, you know, clearance time is gonna be affected if they're progestogenic in nature and are agonizing the progesterone receptor, it's gonna have negative feedback too through a totally separate vector. How much are they, you know, agonizing the estrogen receptor inherently or through their downstream aromatization into methyl estradiol? How, you know, resistance to hepatic clearance is the estrogen produced from the inherent parent compound? These are all going to play into the negative feedback and how long it takes for you to actually recover the baseline. Um, let's see. So they talk about more of... In this study, pituitary function was not significantly affected by any treatment regimen. Apparently, the... Tr fucking phone stopped playing my goddamn alarm. Sorry about that. Thus, the study pituitary function was not significantly affected by any of the treatment regimens. Apparently, the period of treatment was too short and the dose was too low to cause a clear effect. It would seem, therefore, that a decrease in tests caused by short-term treatment with low doses of anabolic steroids is affected at least partially via mechanism other than inhibition of the hypothalamic hypophysial axis, perhaps through changes in the sex hormone binding globulin concentration. Boom! That's what I fucking mentioned at the start, I thought. Duration of altered hormone levels, only blah, 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 blah. Let's see. On the basis of our results, the duration of the decrease in plasma tests would be seem to be subject dependent on and range from one to five weeks. And overcompensation of the test level after anabolic treatment is always seen. Plasma test returns temporarily to a higher level than control level after androgen treatment. The increase may indeed be quite marked. 
levels up to 100% in excess of the basal levels were seen in the present study. The same overcompensation, overcompensation phenomenon has been used in testosterone rebound therapy for the treatment of male infertility. That's honestly the first time I fucking heard of that. As mentioned above, we observe no immediate post-treatment changes in FSH and LH secretion after androgen treatment. Can you imagine being like, this almost reminds me of like the HRT clinics that are like, we're gonna put you on test and then like pull you off because your receptors are like saturated and we're gonna, it's gonna resensitize you. Like, I don't know, like that kind of shit is really bro science-y, but this is actually, kind of, this is interesting. Testosterone rebound therapy, re rebound therapy. Like we're gonna shut you down in order to have you shut down for a periodic, per small period of time and then you're gonna rebound you to above baseline and then you're gonna be naturally more efficient than you were before you used fucking steroids. Seems funny. Um, the depression and LH secretion observed two to six weeks after androgen treatment synchronizes well with the overcompensation period in plasma test levels reflecting proper functioning of the gonadal pituitary feedback system. In addition, at this time, yeah, like I guess hypothetically, if you're shut down and your body is going to freak the fuck out, once there's sufficient clearance of androgen receptor agonism and estrogen receptor agonism, you're going to have a surge of gonadotropins in response to the crash test levels, which may transiently induce a state of like over stimulation of lighting cells, which is going to result in a spike in intratesticular testosterone transiently to above baseline potentially. Yeah, you know, I can, I guess that might fucking happen. In addition, at this time, is it going to be performance enhancing though, given the fact that he had to deal with hypogonadism for a little bit of period of time? Like the seesaw ROI on that, you know? In addition, at this time, a parallel and significant decrease in pituitary FSH secretion as compared to basal levels was observed. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Anyway, let's see what's said in the thread here. First off, I agree with the other guy that this is a type of post the sub needs. I would agree with the point of the super low half-life of D-ball and short cycle duration. Perhaps that was enough for the body to recover. Now, how much lean mass was gained over those four weeks would determine if the cycle itself was worth it because D-ball in itself will make you stronger during your workout. Your numbers will be faked if you take it right before it. Um, I don't really understand the eight month bit, namely in the aspect of seeing how many of those gains were retained after the eight months, given the sporadic nature of the cycles. Adding a serum would definitely make this study more interesting, as you said. So many questions arise from this. It'd be awesome if Derek looked into this and gave some feedback. Although, in my opinion, after reading this, it seems likely what they saw was a blimp, but as time goes on, it would probably level its baseline. Yeah, of course it would level out, but it brings up a much needed possibility of small deep ball cycles being used by those who are uncommitted to long or risky cycles. Up the trend. Downvoted by fucking four points. Another unfunny trend joke added to the count. <laughs> I think one of the factors here is that it takes a while for balls to atrophy and stop producing tests. Four weeks is probably the point where they have not atrophied much yet and are so quick to, are quick to start back up. Yeah, you also have to think about structural integrity of what's going on, how uh, you know toxic is what you're using. You know, progestogen versus a, you know, testosterone derivative. There's obviously going to be a difference in different agonism of different receptors and satellite interactions. Once deep and the half-life, you know, the fucking clearance time, all that shit. And if you have, you know, the structural integrity completely maintained of your balls the entire time and you have like minimal atrophy, you know, you would expect a quicker bounce back than a guy who's been on, you know, nandrolone decanoate for fucking, you know, succumb to complete testosterone shutdown and castration essentially for months on end, there's going to be a marked difference in recovery, I would imagine. Uh, let's see, about the suppression of natural tests, obviously we want high tests, but I think that if your levels are pretty high normally, you will still be able to make gains even while suppressed. The increased free test is very interesting and could possibly mean using d to increase testosterone. My biggest worry for using d in such a way is probably the test fluctuation causing gyno but you can prevent that like you said. Yeah, like in general, what I see from individuals who are using D-ball and getting estrogenic issues such as gyno or individuals who are stacking it with shit like tests. Like if you're using essentially two test bases overlapping on one another, like you can imagine you're going to run into some pretty significant issues, especially if you add in a progestogenic compound on top like a nandrolone, which may upregulate, you know, estrogen receptor sensitivity and or aromatization itself. Um, also, you know, agonism of the progesterone receptor in itself, adding to the compounding effect and causing a one plus one equals disaster effect where you have the deca d -ball, <laughs> deca d -ball test, classic bulk Michelin man cycle, just being overkill as fuck. So that's where I think most people run into issues with D-balls or stacking it with tests, to be honest, which is totally contradictory to how it was run in the golden era. You had guys running D-ball Primo, D-ball Nandrolone. Shit like this was very common and worked quite well. And only in recent years did you see individuals stacking, you know, D-ball as a Kickstarter on top of their test 
with other shit that's estrogenic in some cases too. And it can be even fucking more problematic and then adding in DECA on top. Like it's, those are like the ruthless cycle outcomes with, you know, goddamn like hypertensive crisis situations where you need to go to the hospital because you can't even fucking walk around without a nosebleed. More bitches, more bitches territory, bro. That's the kind of shit you end up in this <laughs> that kind of situation. So anyways, maybe I missed the part talking about free tests. I didn't want to read this entire thing with you guys. Like this video is going to be pushing an hour if I dig through the whole thing. I sorted by free. I couldn't find any mention of free testosterone in this entire article, but I imagine any increase in free test, like I was under the impression we're looking at transient increases in total test levels as opposed to any sort of change in free test. But if it's a change in free test, I can almost guarantee it's a result of crash binding proteins. Um, if it's a result, if the overcompensation of total tests though, that one's more interesting. And I would speculate it must be a result of either a blip, you know, individuals with different lifestyle factors or whatever it is, sleep hygiene. Like this is a snapshot in time of your test. You could literally have a test level lower than baseline, you know, however many hours later, if you just get your blood drawn at a different time with slightly different factors in your lifestyle going on. But if this is all, you know, controlled and super regulated and, you know, this is like an actual representation of what's going on, the only thing I could imagine would explain this is the actual overcompensation of gonadotropin production causing an overstimulation of intratesticular testosterone production as a result of your body sensing that it's entirely deprived and essentially borderline castrated. And it's like, holy fuck, we need to make tests. And then, you know, obviously you get this slight overcompensation effect, potentially short term, but this would eventually level off. And yeah, I guess hypothetically you could argue what, you know, for like, what kind of advantage would you have to this though, for guys who want to leverage, you know, short cycles, is this something you should be doing? I don't really know that I'd be deploying like short oral only bursts that are going to fuck with binding proteins anyway so significantly because eventually you're going to run into potentially like how, how frequently do you do it and what is the actual like myocyte maturation cycle where you actually produce contractile proteins is this you know even sufficient to get like realize like real muscle growth potential out of short little bursts like this with small exposures with basically androgen replacement level dosages I don't really think so, dude. Like, I think you'd be better off looking at actual injectables, to be honest. Um, you know, deep bolt only cycles are, um, they're not as bad as you might have been led to think by the jokes about the deep bolt only cycle gangsters, to be honest. But I mean, um, I would not be utilizing short, like four week exposure bursts to try and like bank up significant amounts of muscle tissue and then bank on this overcompensation period. Hopefully your bow balls don't, you know, atrophy too significantly, waiting for recovery to then run another, you know, like little cycle of 10 milligrams or some shit. Like you're not really going to get anywhere. I think it's going to be, you know, spinning your wheels a bit trying to do this. So um, personally, if you're going to be shutting yourself down at all, like I think the fluctuation in hormones too, you could argue is more unhealthy than just being on like a sustained cycle um, for like a like reasonable duration of time. So again, like to me, this might look like a strategy to deploy around drug testing potentially, um, or for individuals who just like don't want to pin shit. And again, the liver toxicity of the stuff, is this something you want to be relying on as your primary driver of hypertrophy? No, definitely not. So anyways, that is my stance. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Hopefully you found this interesting. It's kind of me just fucking trying to dissect the study as we go here. And, um, not a whole lot of studies on, you know, human use of, you know, compounds that interest us. So anytime there's something that pops up, even if it's old, you know, that's all we have available is old shit. So, you know, it's still interesting to dig into. Like again, that 100 milligram D-ball study, like some of that stuff, you're only going to find digging through old literature. And it's actually really interesting to dive into it because you learn things about these compounds that otherwise go completely overlooked by people who are parroting old, like in misinformation from the bro forums, um, which... I don't know. Not a lot of people really actually dig into the real studies, which is interesting because they're all widely available. So anyways, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplacementdates.com, follow me on Instagram, and moreplacementdates, Facebook, Snapchat, not bitch, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below my TRT clinic. I'll tell medicine from the comfort of your own home, get high quality med medical oversight from doctors who understand it or interpret biomarkers like this, how to keep you as safe as possible during, you know, TRT. Even if you're an abuser of androgens, you need a non-judgmental doctor in your camp who knows how to um, get you the proper lab work and diagnostics and stay on top of your health and try to attenuate any sort of damage you may be exposing yourself to, as well as your, if you're a natural who just wants to optimize your quality of life, um, address any imbalances or deficiencies and see what kind of changes you could be making that could be helping you in a performance, mental acuity, whatever it is, context. 
Um, we're turnkey, we do it all. Check it out in the video description below. Having a high quality doctor in your camp is fucking huge, dude. I cannot stress the importance of that enough, especially after going years of going to local doctors who, you know, literally are so butthurt when you even ask for something as basic as a lipid profile. Having somebody in your camp who is not going to judge you when you try to be proactive about managing your health and optimization is fucking critical, like I mentioned. So anyways, as well, Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas. I designed myself from scratch. My recommended diet model for sports performance and gaining muscle and strength. Um, whilst being mindful of micronutrient intake, having a diet model like this, obviously critical for backfilling hormonal pathways and being as optimized and dialed in from a health aspect, not just from a hitting your fucking protein and macros aspect. Um, the clothing company that sponsors me, the clothing I wear in my videos, um, anything that supports me, it is all in the video descrip description below and you use my coupon codes or my links. Um, it's very much appreciated, helps support the brand. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed that one. Until next time, guys.